All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about chapter four, introduction to eukaryotic cells. And specifically, this week we're going to be talking about eukaryotic cell structure and how it compares to what we've already covered about prokaryotic cell structure last week. All right, so here's an overview of what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to go over the learning objectives. Okay, the uh, goals that this week will uh, help us achieve. And then I'll open it up to questions. Then we will talk about the general structure of eukaryotic cells. We'll cover the theory of endosymbiosis. And then we will compare eukaryotic, archaeal, and bacterial cells. Then we'll go into eukaryotic kingdoms and then we'll talk about what to do for next time. Okay, so. This week will help us uh, move toward achieving the following learning objectives, being able to define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology, identify microbial structures and connect the structures to their functions, and analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. Okay, any questions? Okay, if you think of any questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. All right, so first off, let us go to the structure of eukaryotic cells. All right, first off, to review from last week, what is a structure that all cells have? And our eukaryotic cell is going to have plasma membrane. Yeah, plasma membrane. Okay. All right. Actually, with eukaryotic cells, I think they call it the cell membrane, but in any case, it's a membrane. Okay. And its job is to act as a barrier between the outside and the inside of the cell, okay? Okay, so it keeps the outside stuff out and the inside stuff in, okay? All right, so the next structure, okay, is a defining structure of eukaryotic cells. What would that structure be? If I'm looking through the microscope, what am I going to notice? And I'm going to say, oh, that's got to be a eukaryotic cell. It has a nucleus. It has a nucleus, yes. Okay, so just as a reminder, okay, um, plasma membrane composed of phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so uh, in my cartoon here, I've got phospholipid heads on one side, I've got the little legs sticking in toward each other, okay? So the nucleus is also, okay, has a nuclear membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and the job of the nucleus, okay, is to protect okay, the DNA. Okay, so within the nucleus, we have chromosomes. Okay, and I'm going to draw them in cartoon form. Okay. So when the cell is getting ready to divide, the chromosomes are going to condense and they're going to form these kind of X-like structures, okay? Um, but the rest of the time, uh, the chromosomes are unwound and it's kind of like a bowl full of spaghetti, okay? 
And like spaghetti, okay, the chromosomes, well, actually, let me back up. The chromosomes are composed of DNA. Okay. And also we have protein that acts as a scaffold to hold the DNA so it doesn't get broken. It doesn't get knotted or broken or anything like that. Um, because when it's unwound, okay, DNA in eukaryotes, like spaghetti, is a line. It's a very long line. Okay. So in eukaryotes, the chromosomes tend to be linear. And for this class, we're going to say they are always linear. In biology, there's always exceptions. Okay. So this is a eukaryotic chromosome. Prokaryotes. On the other hand, have a circular chromosome. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, the DNA, as we'll learn more about in chapter five, okay. The DNA contains, uh, has the information uh, for the cell. Okay, in the form of genes. Okay. All right. So the next structure that we're going to talk about okay, actually connects with the nucleus, okay? And once again, we've got a lipid phospholip or a phospholipid bilayer, okay? And it has kind of these tube-like folds, okay? And we have more than one coming off of here, okay? And this has this structure has a really long name called the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. We abbreviate that as ER. Okay. And we have two different types of ER. Okay. We have ER that when we're looking at it underneath the microscope, especially an electron microscope, looks smooth. Okay. So the S here stands for smooth endoplasmic reticulum or smooth ER. Now we have another type of ER that looks like it's studded, okay, with grains of sand, okay? And so we call this the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay? Because because when we look at it underneath the microscope, it looks rough, okay? So what these dots are, these are ribosomes. Okay, that have become embedded in this membrane. Okay, and does anybody remember what ribosomes do? Tell you what, we'll put some ribosomes out here because they're also floating around in the cytoplasm. Don't they hold uh, protein and uh energy um uh, you are close they are composed of proteins and they synthesize proteins and they use energy to synthesize the proteins yep so you're really close good job okay so they take the energy okay that's provided by another structure that we're going to talk about and they use that to synthesize protein and so both of these little guys We've got the cytoplasmic ribosomes. We've got the uh, uh, ribosomes that are bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Okay. Anybody remember what size they are? What S? Seventy. You were close. Eighty. Very good. Good job. Yep. 
And especially at the beginning, when you're first learning this, it's easy to get 70S and 80S backwards. Okay. What was 70S? 70S are prokaryotes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and put these up there. Okay. All right. Good job. So the purpose of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay, is it's involved, it's also involved in protein synthesis. Okay, so we'll put protein synthesis, okay, because we've got all these ribosomes, you know, the ribosomes are making the protein, okay, uh, but they're also um, involved with protein modification. Okay, so once they're made, the process of clipping a little bit here, folding it a little bit differently there, starts to happen in the rough ER, okay? Now the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth ER, is involved in the synthesis of everything else. <laughs> So it's involved in the synthesis of lipids, okay, including phospholipids that make up membranes, okay, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, okay, specific. Well, let me change that from nucleic acids to nucleotides, because the nucleotides that make up nucleic acids, okay, start out here, okay. All right, how are we doing so far? Okay, I'm gonna move this label. I'm gonna get rid of this, but I am recording this so you can go back and look at it later. Let me see, I'm gonna move the label over here so that I've got room for my next structure, okay? So, we have another structure that is also composed of membranes, okay? That's part of what makes a, a, a eukaryotic cell eukaryotic. With all of these membrane, membranous structures, okay? Um, and this is called the Golgi or the Golgi apparatus. And it tends to look like a uh, stack of like pita bread, okay, or stack of pancakes, okay. So the um, the uh, go the job of the Golgi, okay, is to continue with modification okay, of different macromolecules, okay, and packaging. Okay, so we make the raw materials here in the um, endoplasmic reticulums, okay? Then these raw materials get shipped to the Golgi and the Golgi starts putting stuff together, okay? And the things that, uh, that move it from the um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the rough endoplasmic reticulum are called vesicles. Okay, so little, oh, you know what? I don't like that though. That is too close to my labels. Let's get another one. Uh, let's do pink. Okay, so little membrane blebs are going to pinch off, and we call these vesicles. Okay, and they pinch off from here and they go through the cell to the gold meat. Okay. And they deliver their contents. So whether it's lipids, carbohydrates, nucleotides, uh, proteins, okay, they're going to go in here and the gold gene is going to start modifying. It, okay. So let's say that I have a protein in here. In the gold gene, we can attach sugars. Okay, we call that a glycoprotein. Okay, maybe I'll put some fatty acids on it. Okay, that would be called a lipoprotein. Okay, in the Golgi, 
the cell type starts taking the different raw elements, okay, be they uh, lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleotides, and they start mixing and matching and snapping things together, okay? And then at the end, okay, and it goes from this part to this part to this part. And at the end, we have the finished product and it may get shipped to the plasma membrane. It may get shipped back to the ER, okay? It may get sent to the nucleus, okay? So these vesicles can go all over the cell, okay? Now there is a specialized vesicle that I want you to know about, okay? There's lots of different vesicles. They move stuff here, there, everywhere, okay? But there is one that's going to be important later, okay? And it is full of hydro, Lytic enzymes. Okay, now it's been a while since we've talked about hydrolysis or hydrolytic. Okay, but that's a, a vessel. Good... That's a ves vesicle too. Uh, this is yes. This is a vesicle. Um, uh, now I can't say it. Uh, vesicle, yes. And it's, and it's that it's, is one too. Yes, yes, these are, and this is a specialized one that we call the lysosome. Okay, because it lyses stuff. So lyso, and I left out some letters there. Sorry about that. Let's get some. And I just lost my plasma membrane. I got to put it back. Let's see if I can't spell this right. Why so zoom? Okay. And it is a specialized vesicle. Okay. Um, so anybody remember what hydrolysis is? What are these enzymes doing? Adding water. They're adding water, yes. To do what? What is to make a bond? Oh. You were close. You were close. If I'm adding water, am I making a bond or am I breaking a bond? Aren't you breaking a bond? You're breaking a bond. Good job. So dehydration is when we remove water to create a bond. So like if I have two amino acids, okay? I remove the OH from one side and then H from the other, and that hooks them together to hook those amino acids together. And that's what's happening in these ribosomes, okay? Hydrolysis, okay, hydrolytic enzymes are where you add an OH to one side and an H to the other, and you break it apart using water, okay? So lysosomes are full of hydrolytic enzymes, okay? So if there's worn out proteins within the cell, this is uh, overgeneralized, by the way, um, or uh, by the way, we call all of these membranous structures organelles. That means little organs. So it's kind of like the cell is a body and it's got little organs inside of it. So let's say that I have, uh, you know, um, that one of these vesicles is full of uh, worn out parts. Okay, ribosomes that aren't working anymore, that kind of thing. They fuse with the lysosome and they break them down. Okay? Or if this is a, a white blood cell and it's engulfed a bacterium, okay, the lysosome will fuse with the phagosome. Okay, phagocytosis is cell eating. Then it will release those hydrolytic enzymes, those digestive enzymes, and it'll break down the bacterium and kill it. Okay? And the white blood cell can use the uh, use that for energy. Okay, it eats it. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, am I drawing? Oh, um, let me back up. So from the nucleus to the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, to the Golgi, through all of the vesicles. Okay, to the plasma membrane. Okay, we have a name for this. 
Um, and uh, I just forgot it. <laughs> the endoplasmic, no, that's the endoplasmic reticulum. Of course, I forget the name of it. But anyway, they're all connected. Through the vesicles, they're all connected, okay? And they're all a part of the same system, okay? And ribosomes are organelles, but they're not membrane-bound organelles. And so they can pop over here and embed themselves in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They can float around in the cytoplasm, okay? All right. So, um, I'm wondering, do I want to go to the cytoskeleton or do I want to go to um, mitochondria? I'm going to do cytoskeleton. Okay. All right. Now, because I'm kind of packed here, I'm going to clear my drawings and I'm going to set up another cartoon. But this one will be to show the skeletal elements. Okay. But I am going to put a nucleus here because this is. A eukaryotic cell. Now, just like we people have a skeleton, okay, eukaryotic cells have a, a skeleton. We call it a cytoskeleton, okay, or cell skeleton, okay, and it's composed of three different things, okay. The biggest one we've got tubes that are constantly forming, okay, that we call microtubules. They are hollow, okay, and we find them throughout the cell, okay, and they're kind of like the bones of the cell, okay. Now I'm going to erase the plasma membrane and I'm going to put it back. Okay, because microtubules are important in forming a, one of our structures. Okay, um, so we have these microtubules, and I'm not going to draw them in quite the detail that they have because you know my art skills are limited. But microtubules form the inside of this structure and it's covered with the cell membrane, with the plasma membrane, okay? And we call this a flagellum. Okay, so that's one flagella, okay? So if I were to slice this through, I would see a little more complicated structure than I've drawn here. I've got pairs of microtubules that are arranged in a circle. Okay, I've got nine of these going around here. I have drawn nine, okay, and then I've got a pair in the center. And what happens is, is uh, using energy, this will be pulled one direction, okay? So it'll get pulled in this direction and the flagellum will bend and then it relaxes and it kind of comes back, okay? So we get a wave-like motion, okay? or sometimes we call it a whip-like motion, okay? So if you've ever seen pictures of sperm swimming, you have seen flagella in action, okay? Okay, so, but it's considered an internal structure because the plasma membrane wraps around it, okay? And it's microtubules that form that structure. And like I said, we have them all throughout the cell. Now, when the cell is getting ready to divide, okay, they will um, form, okay? So I've got a, a cell that's, that's getting ready to divide, okay? Um, it will form what's called the mitotic spindle. And that mitotic spindle helps separate the copies of the chromosomes into each cell, each new cell. So these microtubules are important in cell division, okay? 
So that's the job of the microtubules, okay? Now we've got um, another kind, we've got actin filaments, okay? Actin filaments are not tubes, they're like uh, little springy rods, okay? And they tend to line the inside just under the cell membrane to give it support, okay? That's as far as we're gonna go on the job of actin. It does a whole lot of other things, but for this class, that's all you need to know. That gives you a good start, okay? And then we have intermediate filaments, okay? So I've got intermediate filaments, okay, that uh, well, they show up in other places, okay? They form mesh-like structures, okay? To help reinforce and provide strength to the cell. Okay, so we're just going to kind of draw it in here. And they are called intermediate filaments because they are intermediate in size. So it's kind of like this cell has bones. It's kind of like it's got cartilage. Okay, so these are intermediate. Okay, so questions about the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is composed of the two elements or is it the three? Is the actin three. part of it? Yep, okay. actin is part of it. So we have actin, which is the smallest, intermediate, and the microtubules are the biggest. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention. Okay, so um, there are eukaryotic single cells that move along by the process of flagella, okay? In the human body, sperm have flagella, they have a flagellum, okay? Um, but we also have another structure. It's basically built the same way as a flagellum, it's just smaller, okay? So it's still membrane bound, and we still have microtubules, but they're short, okay? So we have protozoa that move through cilia, okay? So all of these little cilia kind of look, act like ores, and they go stroke, 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 okay? And they help the, the little guy swim, okay? In human cells, we have a lot of ciliated cells. So in my respiratory tract, and I'm gonna put some respiratory cells here, gotta give them a nucleus. And I've got a, glo a goblet cell, okay? Kind of shaped like a goblet, okay? So goblet cells produce mucus. So we're gonna give our respiratory tract a layer of mucus here, okay? And uh, the purpose of that is for um, bacteria, viruses, you name it, to get stuck in that. Now surrounding the goblet cells are ciliated cells. And we have ciliated cells all over our mucosa, okay? So that's the, uh, like the inside of my mouth, my digestive system, my lungs, my reproductive tract, the inside of your bladder, okay? Um, we have these ciliated cells and whoops, I'm putting cilia on my goblet cell. There's no cilia, cilia on the goblet cell, but they go stroke, 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 and they move this mucus that has all sorts of nasty stuff trapped in it, okay? Toward um, up and out of the lungs, out of the sinuses, into the back of the throat. And then the goal is for you to either, you know, cough it up or swallow it down. And it ends up in the acid bath of your stomach, okay? Killing all the stuff that was, in theory, uh, that was in that mucus, okay? So cilia can either move the cell, okay, like in some protozoa, or they can move things past a group of cells in a multicellular organism, okay? And uh, just like the flagellum, they have microtubules, okay? 
that stick out. They're just shorter. Flagellum, the flagella are long, cilia are short. Okay. Now we do see flagella in bacterium, okay? But instead of doing a wave-like motion, okay, let's say this is a bacterium and I've got a flagellum here, it's going to turn 360. It's going to spin like a little outboard motor, okay? Whereas with eukaryotic flagella, they go back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. How are we doing on the cytoskeleton? Okay. Today, because we had enough to cover, okay, I'm uh, more asking questions of, you know, hey, you know, like at the beginning when I was talking about, you know, oh, all eukaryotic cells have a nucleus and uh, what are the membranes composed of, okay? So I will do that kind of thing. I'm not, I don't have application style questions to ask you today. We will save that for next time. But let's move on to our last group of organelles, okay? Things that are on the inside of the eukaryotic cell, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, yes. Okay, inside of all eukaryotic cells, we have what is called a mitochondrion. It's got an outer membrane and it's got an inner membrane that has these folds that we call cristae. And we're gonna learn more about what goes on in this structure, but this is a mitochondrion. Okay. We also, if there's more than one, we call it mitochondria, okay? So we've got an outer membrane, we've got an inner membrane, and we've got all sorts of enzymes that dot this inner membrane, okay? And I've got enzymes that are also in the internal part that we call the matrix. And the main job of the mitochondria is to produce energy. Okay. Now, the, the uh, mitochondria are not a part of the vesicle system that connects the nucleus to the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, okay, to the plasma membrane. They're kind of separate, okay. Um, and they produce energy in the form of ATP. And so they make all this ATP and they ship that out to the rest of the cell, okay? Now, interestingly enough, they also have ribosomes sitting inside here, okay? And interestingly, let's go ahead and put the uh, eukaryotic ribosomes out here. We'll make some a few cytoplasmic ones, okay? Just for the fun of it. What size are these ribosomes? They are what F? 80. Very good, 80 S, okay? Interestingly, the ribosomes within the mitochondria, ribosomes, okay? Okay, are 70 S. Hmm. What other kind of cells have 70 S ribosomes? Prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, yes. And interestingly enough, mitochondria have a teeny tiny little circular genome. Okay. So what are some other 
cells that have a circular genome. What is that? It's supposed to be a circular chromosome or genome. Okay. I said genome. I meant chromosome. So prokaryotes. Very good. Okay, so you know they're starting to look like little bacteria. They're looking like little bacteria. And so a hypothesis was proposed, okay, that these guys used to at one time be free living bacteria, okay, because they're about the size of a bacterium, okay. Bacteria have, let's say this is a gram negative cell, okay, got an outer membrane. Okay, and if it's aerobic, it's plasma or cell membrane is all crinkled up like this, okay? And uh, we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan as a cell wall, okay? They have 70S ribosomes, okay? And they have a circular chromosome, okay? So the hypothesis was proposed that at one point, the ancestor of eukaryotic cells okay, was aerobic. It did not have the enzymes to use oxygen, okay? but it engulfed, it phagocytized okay, a little prokaryotic aerobic cell. And that aerobic cell um, instead of dying, instead of being eaten, developed into the mitochondria, okay? One of the first things that happened is it lost its peptidoglycan cell wall. Mitochondria do not have cell walls, okay? But the outer membrane of mitochondria is, are very similar to the plasma membrane, okay? The inside is a little different. Okay? There are some differences, okay? But that would explain how it got 70S ribosome and why it has its own little genome. Yeah. So we call this, okay, we have enough data. Well, let me, before I tell you what it's called, um, what we did is we took, okay, so we took the, the chromosomes, okay, from the nucleus, we call this the nuclear DNA, okay. We took that and we sequenced it. So it's like we did Ancestry.com on them or 23andMe, okay? So we took the DNA from the nucleus, okay? So nuclear DNA, okay? And we took the mitochondrial DNA, okay? We often abbreviate that as mtDNA. We also call it maternal DNA because you get all of your mitochondria from your mom. We sequenced that, and then we took the DNA from various types of bacteria. And we did a little ancestry.com on them. And as it turns out, mitochondria and some types of bacteria, okay, that live in your intestines um, are like 70% uh, related. Okay, so it's like their fourth or fifth cousins, okay? Whereas we saw something closer to 20% related with the nuclear DNA. So mitochondria and, and uh, these types of bacteria are very closely related. It's been a long time since they've been together to a family reunion, okay? Because these guys have been living inside of cells. These have been off uh, living here, there, everywhere, okay? And so we've had differences occur, okay? And these free living bacteria are adapted to living outside of a cell, whereas mitochondria have adapted to the point of not being able to live outside of a cell, okay? And the rest of the eukaryotic cell can't live without the mitochondria, okay? So we've been together for so long, we just can't live without each other literally. <laughs> and we call this, okay, because we have enough data 
that is not a hypothesis anymore. It's graduated to being a theory. Remember, a theory is a hypothesis or a series of hypotheses that have a lot of data to support it. Okay, so this is the theory of endosymbiosis. Okay, so um, endo for internal symbiosis living together. Okay. So what really sealed the deal was the uh, related sequences. And by the way, I'm, I'm uh, vastly um, uh, rounding for this, but it's, you know, it's in that approximate range. Okay. All right, questions. Questions about the theory of endosymbiosis uh, and how it relates to mitochondria. Okay, let me get rid of this in between guy here. Okay, so all eukaryotes okay, have mitochondria. Or organelles that used to be mitochondria. Okay. All right. So there are eukaryotic cells that underwent another endosymbiotic event. Okay. So we have living out in the wild, we have bacteria. Okay. Actually, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to draw that in yellow. Okay, so I've got my plasma membrane. I have a thin peptidoglycan cell wall. I have an outer membrane. So these guys are gram negative. But packed on the inside, I've got membranous discs or sacs. Okay. And they are involved in photosynthesis. And these cells, okay, photosynthesize and they're green, okay? And we used to call them algae, but they don't have a nucleus. So they got kicked out of the eukaryotic family because to be algae, you have to have a nucleus, okay? So we have since called them cyanobacteria. They used to be called blue-green algae. And you'll still see them referred to that. Okay. And sometime in the distant past, a uh, eukaryotic cell that had a mitochondrium engulfed a cyanobacterium. Okay. And the same sort of thing happened to that cyanobacterium that happened to the mitochondria. It was able to survive, okay? Got so that we were living in harmony and we have another organelle that plants and algae have, okay? We've got an outer membrane. Is this sounding familiar? We have an inner membrane and we have these sets of flattened discs, okay? That hang out on the inside. And these guys also have 70S ribosomes and they also have a circular chromosome. I'm gonna leave room for that. So let's put our chromosome over here, okay? We've got a little circular chromosome here, okay? And we call these chloroplasts. And they are what makes a plant green. Okay, so they are also involved in energy production. Okay, so chloroplasts, we only find them in plants and algae. Okay. So chloroplasts are also involved in energy production.
but they do it, okay, when light comes in, just a little get red light because that's one of the lights that they use. So when light comes down and hits this, the uh, chloroplast is able to use the energy of light to produce sugars. And then these sugars are sent out of the cell where they undergo some processes that we'll talk about in chapter eight on metabolism, okay? And uh, then they get sent to the mitochondria and the mitochondria use them to make a lot of ATP. Okay, questions. Oh, and when we sequence the DNA from a chloroplast versus a cyanobacteria, they're even closer, more closely related than mitochondria and uh, gamma proteobacteria. Okay, how are we doing? So did you say they just have inside is just the circular genome and then uh -huh. the green little disc and that's all that's inside of them? Uh, there's a whole bunch of enzymes and stuff, but you can't see them with a, with a microscope. Okay, nothing for us to know about. Yeah, that's all you need to know about. That, okay. Let's go ahead and put some ribosomes in there too because they've got ribosomes. And, and they ribosome. are, yep, and they are 70S ribosomes. They're 70S? Yep, just they are. Like, exactly. Just like the my, my, my code. Mitochondria? Yeah, that thing. Okay. Okay. So all of this evidence helps support the theory of endosymbiosis. Okay. All eukaryotic cells underwent the endosymbiotic event, okay, that led to getting mitochondria, okay? And every time the cell divides, these little mitochondria are also dividing, and some mitochondria end up in one cell and the others end up in the other cell. Same thing with the chloroplasts, okay? So they divide independently of the rest of the cell, but the thing that really got it, okay, was the DNA sequences. That end of the argument, okay? Because we can explain away all of these other things, okay? But sequences that indicate genetic relatedness, okay? That sealed the deal. Okay, questions? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint briefly just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. So we've covered the structure, the basic structure that all eukaryotic cells have. And by talking about the chloroplast, we introduced a structure that some eukaryotic cells have. Okay. And we talked about the theory of endosymbiosis, okay, of internal living together, okay. So we've got what used to be free living bacteria that have now adapted, evolved to the point where they can't live outside of the cell, the eukaryotic cell, and we, the eukaryotic cells, we cannot live without them. Okay. okay, so let's go ahead and compare the three different groups of cells that we've talked about so far. Last chapter, chapter um, three, we talked about archaeal cells, archaea, bacteria, okay, and now we're talking about eukaryotes. So this is a good time to go ahead and compare the three. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and put bacteria over here. And I'm going to ask you, okay, apparently I can't write and talk at the same time. <laughs> All right, let's get you carry over here. 
Okay, and these are our three domains. This is the most broad designation for different types of cells based on their structures and their genetics. Okay, so I'm going to, okay, as a form of study, I'm going to ask you guys to tell me certain structures that are in bacteria versus archaea versus eukarya. Okay. And it's okay if you don't remember, okay? Especially since we're just starting eukaryotes at this point. But it's good to struggle to remember, okay? And if you get it wrong, that is perfectly okay. This is practice, okay? All right, so what structure can we see under the microscope that we look at it and we go, oh yeah, that's a eukaryote. All eukaryotes have? A membrane enclosed nucleus. Very good, a membrane enclosed nucleus. Okay, I'm gonna shorten that to this nucleus just for the sake of space, okay? So, do bacteria have a nucleus? No. No, they have no nucleus. Okay, that is why we call them prokaryotes, okay? How about archaea, do they have a nucleus? No. Very good. So these guys are bro both prokaryotes. Okay, which means they do not have a nucleus. Okay. All right, let's go to ribosomes. What size ribosomes do bacteria have? And if you get it backwards, that's perfectly okay. Repetition is, is what gets it so that it stays longer and longer memory. 70. Very good, very good. We have 70th ribosome. How about archaea? 70. Very good, 70th ribosome. Okay, what about eukaryotes? 80. 80, very good. In the cytoplasm. And when you ask that, that's what you're talking about. When you ask yes. that question, you're going to refer to the cytoplasm, not like the extra buddies that he's eaten. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. But just to be clear, just because we were talking about it, okay? But inside the mitochondria, and if I asked a question, I would ask a question like this. Mitochondria have what size of ribosome? 70. Very good, 70S. Yay! All right, how are we doing? We're doing all right. Okay, so another difference, okay, is DNA sequence. I can take the DNA and I can sequence it. And in chapter five, we're going to talk about what we mean by DNA sequencing. Okay. There are differences in the DNA sequence between bacteria and archaea and eukaryotes. Okay. So we have a difference in DNA sequence. Okay. And it was from looking at the sequence of specific genes, okay, that led us to say, hey, these are different. We didn't know they were different because when we look at the ribosomes, they're the same size, okay? Neither one of them have a nucleus, okay? But once we saw the DNA sequence, we went, huh, you know what? We ought to take, some, uh, take a look and see what other differences we have, okay? And uh, when we did the sequence, it was interesting. We found that archaea are a little bit more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. And I'm going to draw kind of a family tree to show you um, kind of how that happened. Okay. So we started looking at these ribosomes. And you know what? We found a funny thing. Okay. Bacteria have a certain shape. I'm going to call this a bacterial shape. So on my cartoon of a ribosome, 
Okay, we'll say that, and this is just a cartoon. This is not what it actually looks like because my artistic skills are not that good. But we'll say that a bacterial ribosome kind of has this shape. But over here, eukaryotes, okay, they have a eukaryotic shape. Okay, and so if I were to draw them, we'll say these internal structures are a little more square. And we have a little different shape. Still a ribosome, it still makes proteins, but antibiotics that attack bacteria leave our ribosomes alone, okay? Antibiotics that shut down the functioning of this, it's not the right shape over here, okay? Interestingly, archaea, even though they have the smaller ribosomes, their, ri their ribosomes are closer to the eukaryotic shape. Okay, so it's kind of like they're halfway in between bacteria and eukaryotes. Okay, interesting, huh? Okay, now they've got some other differences, okay, that um, show up in like the cell membrane. Okay, um, and uh, so I won't go into those, but I do have them in the table that I have in both chapter three and chapter four. Okay, there's differences in the cell membrane in their phospholipid bilayers. Okay, but the other thing I want you to know, okay, is cell wall composition. Most bacteria have a cell wall. Okay, that is composed of anybody remember? The big long is it, uh, peptidoglycan. Very good, peptidoglycan. Okay, so it's modified glucose units, and it's got some uh, amino acid chains that hook it together. So peptido is for the protein, glycan is for the sugar units. Okay, so it's kind of like um, the bacterial cell walls are uh, teriyaki jerky. <laughs> They've got some sweet there. We got some protein going on there. Okay. Archaea have cell walls, but they do not have peptidoglycan. They've got another molecule that makes up. So no peptidoglycan. Okay. And why am I having you remember Okay, the, and I left the P out peptidoglycan. Um, why am I having you learn this peptidoglycan? It's because um, this is important when we talk about immunology, okay? When we talk about antibiotics, okay? Um, penicillin, ampicillin, methicillin, all of your cillins, okay? Attack a bacterial's ability to make peptidoglycan, okay? So it may not have any effect on archaea, okay? Definitely doesn't bother eukaryotes at all, okay? Because eukaryotes have a cell wall, but they're never made out of peptidoglycan either, okay? So if I'm a eukaryote, okay? And this is where we're getting into differences between the different kingdoms, okay? If I am, you know, let me get rid of my funky shaped ribosome here. If I am a fungi, most fungi have a cell wall that's made out of chitin. Okay. It's also a modified sugar chain, okay? But penicillin is not going to bother the cell wall synthesis of fungi because it's not peptidoglycan. Okay. In fact, we get penicillin from fungi. They're not going to make something that's going to punch holes in their old cell wall. That would be silly. Okay, so fungi have chitin, okay, some types of algae and all plants have cell walls that are composed of cellulose. Okay, cellulose is what we make paper out of. Okay, we take plants, specifically woody plants that have a whole lot of cellulose, 
we chop them up, we make wood pulp out of it, we squish the water out of it, and that makes paper. And paper is composed almost entirely of cellulose. Okay. So eukaryotes, they may have cell walls, but they're not composed of peptidoglycan. Okay. So these are the main differences I want you to know for how we can tell whether something is a bacterium, an archaea, or a eukaryote. So um, on the eukaryotes, they don't have the peptotide glycan either then? Nope, they do not. So they yeah, eat, let me put that each, up. each different type has a different cell con construction, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. So no peptidoglycan. And so that's why when you take an antibiotic, say you take penicillin, okay, um, it's not going to bother the few fungi, the few yeast that are hanging around in your digestive tract, okay, or in your reproductive tract. But when the bacteria get knocked down, okay, they get killed by the penicillin, the fungi say, hey, I've got all sorts of room. Let's have a bunch of kids. And so they expand and you end up with the yeast infection because yeast are not bothered because they don't have a peptidoglycan cell wall. That falls under the category of why we care. Okay, questions. Hey, if you have some questions, I'm happy to back up. Okay, so let me draw you a family tree, okay? Based on DNA sequencing, okay? This is what we found, okay? Originally, there was an ancestral cell or more likely an ancestral cell population, okay? And somewhere along the line, there was a split, okay? and different cell types started mutating and, uh, and becoming different, okay? And the first split was between bacteria, okay? And the ancestors of archaea and eukaryotes, okay? Then somewhere along the line, the same thing happened. We had a split. We ended up with archaea, and eukaryotes. Now, somewhere along the line, okay, we had bacteria over here, okay, the ancestors of the mitochondria that came over and were engulfed by eukaryotes, okay, and we had the ancestor of the chloroplasts. Okay, that were engulfed okay, and it ended up in plants and algae. Okay. Interesting, huh? You can find all sorts of interesting things um, from looking at genes and looking at DNA. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Let's go ahead and talk about different types of eukaryotic cells. Okay. So I'm just for the sake of um, uh, reminding where we've been, we've got bacteria, we've got archaea, okay, these are both prokaryotes, and then we have eukaryotes. And based on structures, we have split eukaryotes into four different kingdoms, okay, for now. We have animals, okay, and all animals have a certain type of cell, okay, and then we have plants, and I'm going to go ahead and put um, green algae. Oops. Let's not spell it green algae. And then I've got fungi, 
why I cannot spell today. Never been my strong suit, but it's a little worse today. And then we have protozoa. Okay, so just as a reminder, there are certain structures that all eukaryotes have. They all have a nucleus or more than one nucleus. Um, they have endoplasmic reticulums. They have Golgi. They have lysosomes. Okay. They have microtubules and such for their cytoskeletons. Okay. They all have that. So these things are what make them different. Okay. So animals, okay, no cell wall. Your cells do not have cell walls. Okay. So that makes them more flexible. Now we use the cytoskeleton to reinforce them and help them keep their shape, okay? But they do not have cell walls. Plants and green algae do have cell walls, okay? And they are composed of cellulose, okay? Fungi have cell walls. Anybody remember what their cell walls are made of? It's okay if you don't, we just barely covered it. Titan. Titan, very good. Okay. And then protozoa, we just kind of toss everything that doesn't fit into animals, plants, or fungi. We tossed into protozoa. And they do not have a true cell wall. Some of them have structures that sure look like a cell wall to me, but you know, if I knew more about protozoa, I would be able to say, oh yeah, that's not a true cell wall, okay? All right, animals are always multicellular. You've gotta have at least two cells to be considered an animal, okay? And so far as I know, one of the simplest animals that we study, okay, is a worm, Believe it or not, worms are animals, okay? And it has exactly 999 cells. And we can track it from a fertilized egg to that many cells. Actually, I'm wondering if I'm slipping a decimal and it's 9,999. Anyway, it's 9999 through there somewhere, okay? Okay, so always multicellular. If you are not multicellular, you are not an animal, okay? Plants, okay, plants are all multicellular, okay? Algae, on the other hand, we have algae that are single cell, and we have some that are multicellular, okay? Like seaweed, kelp, okay? And all plants and algae have chloroplasts. Now, if you go on and take biology too, you will realize that I have oversimplified things. There are some algae that have uh, lost their chloroplasts, but for this class, we can generalize and say that all plants and algae have chloroplasts. They are all photosynthetic, okay? Okay, fungi, okay, um, can be single cellular, okay? We call them yeast. And if they're multicellular, okay, we call them either mold or mushrooms. Okay, those are both multicellular. In other words, we can see them with the naked eye. Okay. Okay, protozoa, on the other hand, they are all single celled. And that's pretty much all the characteristics of protozoa you need to know for this class. Okay. okay, yeah, we've got about five minutes left. Okay, so let's see, is there any other structures that I want you to know about? Okay, so fungi are non photosynthetic. Okay, 
so if they're green, it's just a green pigment. They're not actually doing photosynthesis. Okay. Animals. Okay. Are non photosynthetic. Okay. Actually, we just recently found one exception, but I'm not going to make you remember that one. <laughs> Okay, so non-photosynthetic, okay? Um, animals ingest, okay? They take bites out of stuff and they swallow it down so they have a digestive system. System, okay? Fungi, on the other hand, they don't have teeth, they don't have a stomach. They release enzymes out into the environment and then they absorb, absorb, okay, the nutrients. Okay, and fungi between all of the different species of fungi can break down about anything, okay? They can break down leaves, they can break down the sugar in your fruit. They can break down oil and oil slicks. They can do that anyway. They're pretty cool. Okay, so any questions about what makes the different kingdoms different of eukaryotes? Okay, I hit you with a bunch of information today. Like I said, next time we meet, uh, I will be asking you questions to apply what you learned today. Okay, so here's what to do for next time, okay? Um, on Saturday, I will be checking in Sarago to see how you're doing, okay? If you've been working consistently in Sarago, um, you started chapters one through four, you started chapter four, beginning of this week, um, then you're good to go especially if you continue uh, to review the terms when Sarah Go reminds you to, okay? If you have uh, kind of fallen off a little bit, you haven't been doing it consistently, if you start chapters one through four, okay, this week and start working on them, you will get some points, okay? You'll get quite a few points. Maybe not full points, but some is better than none, okay? So that I'm gonna check on Saturday morning. Okay, so also I encourage you to continue to work on the biochemistry badge. It is not due this Friday, but it's due a week from Friday. And it'll take you more than one week to work on it. Okay. And then also come with questions. Come with questions for next time uh, because I will be asking you questions. Hey, any questions? We've got a few minutes. Or have I just bludgeoned you with information to the point where you can't even think of whether you have a question or not? For the um, reviewing the test, uh -huh. do you want us to email you and then we set up a meeting or can we just join your office hour? Uh, yes. So um, thank you for reminding me. Exam one closes this Saturday. Uh, so make sure you have it done Saturday before 11.59 p.m. Okay. Then next week, uh, you can just come to my office hours and I'll have them set up. I'll have what's called the waiting room set up. So you'll join, it'll be just you. And I'll either let you in so that you can uh, see and talk to me and I'll pull up your exam and we can go over it. Or I'll send you a text or a chat saying, hey, it's gonna be another five, 10 minutes. Okay, so I will, I'll always let you know about how long it'll be, okay? Um, so yes, just come to the office hours. You don't have to set up a time. If my office hours do not work with you, with your schedule, then do email me and we can set up another time, okay? So uh, I came now, to your office oh, today and you, you weren't there. Oh, yes, on thank your hours. you. Yes, I was going to apologize for that before the class started and I forgot. I rescheduled the office hours to four. And because I had never done that before, I forgot. That was it on was, Monday. 
Yeah, that was on Monday. Yeah, well, my today, apologies. And today you weren't at your in your office hours. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I was late getting there. I was about 15 minutes late. So my okay. apologies. Yeah, my lab went longer. So my apologies. So will you um, be there tomorrow? Um, I will be there tomorrow. Yes. Okay. And uh, I have set an alarm so that... <laughs> <laughs> I won't forget and uh, I don't have lab right before it so um I won't be I won't be late either and I won't forget so my humble apologies for not being there on Monday and coming late today so um I'm thinking that I need to push back my Tuesday office hours uh by half an hour because I am always cutting a really close to get from the lab which is an end cab back to my office which is in willoughby and if the lab goes over i just don't make it <laughs> so my apologies i i do have one question about serigo how uh -huh. um you mentioned that we need to at least complete chapter four how how is that i know when i'm actually inside the uh, app that i'm that i'm there like that i'm in uh, chapter four that is a very good question. Let me show you how to how to tell that. Let me close this down and because I don't recall, I wrote I don't recall seeing like the by chapters. Um, yeah, and it it shows you unfortunately. Um, uh, it, it brings up the chapters not in order. Uh, I need to bug them again. But if you click on the knowledge bank, you can scroll down and you will uh -huh. see, and uh, these, these are um, for a different class, but they are like C01 is chapter one, and then we'll have the name of the chapter. Okay. And then there's C02, um, it will say C02, um, I think it's called biochemistry and molecules or life or something along that line. Okay. Hmm. So then you can go and you can click on the one you want. So they're not in order? They are not in order. Mm, okay. okay. Unfortunately not. Okay. okay. So okay. these are for, um, so like uh, here, oh, so here's the, the current ones. So the first one's going to be MMBS 111C01, Introduction to Microbiology. And it'll say audio because we've set it up that you can click on the term or the definition and it'll say it to you. Okay. And so biochemic uh, biochemistry basics, that's the second one, introduction to prokaryotic cells. So um, for chapter one and chapter two, you need to be at least to level one. So if you look up here, you can see that I on uh, for general microbiology, antimicrobial medications, I've reached level 1.1, Woohoo! which would be really impressive, but I started it three years ago and I haven't finished. So. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll need to be at level one for these. Um, I think for three, you need to be at level um, uh, 0.5. And then you just need to have started chapter four. Okay, does that help? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll call it good. And like I said, oh, uh, let's see, um, Rosa, I think, yeah, you just asked your question. So I think we're good on that one. Um, so my apologies for not being to office hours uh, on the second one on Monday and then uh, late today. So I will do better. And then um, we have uh, office hours. Um, I'll be holding them for two hours tomorrow. Okay. And uh, I originally, planned on canceling the office hours on Thursday, but I think I may um, do my usual 1.30 to 2.30. Just be aware that I might be late. Yeah, I've got uh, a, a lab right before that. Sometimes and what time does it start later. tomorrow? Tomorrow it starts, uh, let me double check my, my, my uh, schedule here to make sure I have it correctly. Um, so tomorrow they start at 1.30 and they will go until 3.30.
Yep. And uh, in yeah. the, in that, when we come in, will if we don't come in with questions, would you be willing to ask us questions to see if we can answer them? Because sometimes you kind of think you know it, but then you're like, hmm, apparently I don't. Yeah. Sure, sure. I can have some questions ready. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, see, Alyssa says, uh, I think you have like a, a, an hour and a half. Um, yeah, so uh, on Wednesday, it'll go from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. And so that'll be two hours. And you use the same link as for the, the 1.31. Hey, other questions. Okay, we will call it good and uh, I'll leave the